Day 205 of the Ukrainian War Map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Jelzy here, and today is another quick update as I like to take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine today. And as always, I like to start off with some of those Russian military losses. So military personnel losses will commence with the game today. So currently sitting on, oh, move that to today's date, 54,050 troops. So an additional 200 losses there. Now this wounded figure is just a, a multiple of three of the killed figure. So it is just an approximation. Then we move across to the Russian hardware losses. So starting off the armored combat vehicles. So an additional eight losses there. Then for tanks, a, an additional six. Then seven artillery as well. And one chopper as we can see down the bottom there. Oh, and I think I've got a photo for that one shortly too. But we'll move across to the map now and take a look uh, again outside of Ukraine to begin with, as we sometimes certainly indeed do in the Belgorod Oblast, where a customs terminal is on fire just above the city of Kharkiv on the north side on, of course, the, the Russian side there. But also a little bit further away, explosions were reported in a, a smaller town or area in Velukai, right here. Now, Russian authorities also blame Ukraine for this one. Uh, there was uh, some blackouts and communications issues. Those sorts of things were down in this location for a period of time as well. Now, naturally, the region's governor accused Ukraine's armed forces of striking the location. Uh, Ukraine has not yet commented on the incident. Then we move down across to the Kharkiv region, the recently liberated area, where the Ukrainian EOD, aka the Bomb Squad, has come to remove mines in the recently liberated areas, mostly to the east of the Oblast. Now this reminds me of, well you may remember the Russian troop withdrawal back in March this year, for example in the Kyiv region, where before Russian troops left they made uh, the biggest dick move in my opinion of mining the, mining the place up. But it looks like this time because of the surprise Ukrainian blitzkrieg uh, attack or counteroffensive to retake the north, there hasn't been much uh, in the way of mines reported yet because the Russians had to flee from the broken lines pretty quickly. Now you may have heard Russia called it a gesture of goodwill to leave the Kharkiv Oblast, but it was, it was just to save face for or from an embarrassing loss. Also in the liberated settlements of Kharkiv, Ukraine is putting the lights back on. So where Ukraine has uh, liberated over 300 settlements in Kharkiv, or the Oblast there, since the 6th of September, they've gone ahead and uh, reset up some infrastructure, including power infrastructure and water pumping infrastructure there as well. Now, as you might expect in the region, there's more fines every day. So there was also uh, an additionally deserted fair amount of Russian equipment located in the last 24 hours here, which includes this high value R381 T2M Signet platform. Now, these things do intelligence gathering by interception of signals. Uh, whether communications between people or from electronic signals, radio frequencies, really a whole plethora of interception techniques. So it's good. It's a good score for, for Ukraine for sure. And in case you were curious, there is still plenty of losses by Russian forces in the Kharkiv Oblast when it comes to destroyed hardware. For instance, these newly located damaged tanks. Here we have uh, two T-72 tanks, one T-80 tank, and one SPG, it's the top uh, right photo, which is a, a self-propelled gun. So these vehicles look like a tank, but actually have less armor and are, are better for long range distance shooting. Basically a howitzer on wheels or trucks. <laughs> 
Also on the topic of Russian hardware destruction, got uh, some video footage here of a warehouse full of destroyed Russian vehicles found, of course, in the Kharkiv Oblast as well. Likely from a, a HIMARS strike, for instance, there's at least two Kamaz trucks uh, identified here and many other trucks of an unknown purpose since there is barely anything left of the remains to actually identify them with. Oh, and it might be good to mention, there is also a pro-Ukrainian Chechen uh, group, a battalion fighting alongside the Yukis. And they happen to capture, quote unquote, score, uh, a more modern T-80 tank as well. So that's always nice to see. Then, of course, we move down to the ever-contested Donbass, where Ukraine has made some, some ground, some gains here in the Donbass in the last 24 hours or so. So if we zoom in just a smidge, so just north of Slovyansk, the city of Slovyansk, if we use the date map and we go backwards and forwards, we can see a whole area here. So I might just zoom in because this will make a bit of better sense. So we'll go to the, the last day here. So they've pushed the Russians back as we can see here. Probably the most beautiful thing about this is the fact that uh, Ukrainians seem to be able to go over rivers, beyond rivers, whereas the Russian side has had that problem with this type of land obstacle. Maybe they're afraid of the water, but it's good to see that the Ukrainians have this capability anyway. And on the date map as well, just a little bit further over, so in uh, the east side of Izium. So if we go back just a couple of days, we can see uh, it's been pushed through. So in other words, it's being cleaned up by the Ukrainians and they're pushing the, the Russians back on that side there as well. Now, speaking of withdrawing troops or Russian troops, now the Russian forces are withdrawing troops to the Svartov area right here to sort of uh, really digging their heels in, preparing to defend at this location. But also Troitsk, just directly, well, due north of it there. So at the, the Russian border, effectively. So effectively, we have Russia pulling back, fortifying its positions. It's, uh, it's, it's decreased its, its level of expectation in terms of what it thinks it can achieve and what it thinks it can't achieve. And it, it just seems to be pulling back to the Donbass there. And further into the Donbass, in the Donetsk Oblast, there is a, there was an ammunitions depot exploded. So this was in uh, Moss Pine. So that is uh, right here, Moss Pine. So this is sort of southeast of the Donetsk city. In fact, closer to the front line just yesterday, there was a, an ammunitions dump that exploded. So this is a classic example of Russia starting to move ammunition dumps further and further away from the front line, but not clearly far enough. Then we move across to the Dnipro Petrovsk Oblast here. So we'll zoom out. It's around this region here where we've actually had two more missile strikes uh, from the Russian side at the Krivi Re hydrotechnical dam infrastructure again. So it was just yesterday where Russia struck this region as well. So they want to strike the dam, basically make it overfill, fill up the Inuits River and hurt the the uh, the offensive or the counteroffensive, the Ukrainian counteroffensive in the Kherson front line there, which it goes down to. Again, it's illegal to hit a dam during times of war, as per the the UN uh, war charter there, due to various things like civilian and ecological impacts. And also in this region, we don't know where. We've got some of the uh, photographic evidence though. We can now see the second documented use of Iranian. UAVs by the Russian army. Uh, the remains of the Shahid 136 loitering munition, so basically a suicide drone, uh, was found in, uh, actually it was close to Nikopol, I believe, somewhere around here, but we don't know the exact location. Now the UAV, which is a, an unmanned aerial vehicle, can be identified by an Iranian Mado M550 engine, so they say, usually left intact after the explosion. 
Now, what's important about this, I think, uh, to me, is this is the second downing of an Iranian drone in in the last two days. Perhaps they're quite vulnerable to either, say, counter-electronic warfare guns or any number of air defense systems that Ukraine currently employs. So that's good to see. Then we move down to the close-by Kherson counter-offensive front line where the Ukrainian forces have consolidated previous gains successfully. We don't have the perfectly, most perfectly updated map here, but uh, we can see in that mid-rift section, it's pushing through. Now, the funny thing is Russian forces still continue to use transport aircraft and boats to supply logistics to their forces above the Dnipro River at the Kherson front line or the north bank here. And even with, say, the use of helicopters, this is still not enough for them to sustain their Russian army, and it's certainly very risky for the, the Russian helicopter pilots too. And also around the front uh, line where the, the, the Russian, uh, well, there was actually a Russian Su-25 shot down here near the front line of the Kherson area. Uh, Russia is having to overextend its assets in order to attempt to stop Ukrainian advances. So Russia is really just throwing everything they can at it, but they are getting a lot of losses as a result. And the heaviest fighting of which is uh, still in the north. In fact, uh, pretty consistent with the Oinky or Orky pigs you can see here. And we've got some photos of a... Kherson base destroyed. Now this is in no surprise here, Nova Kokova there. So I try not to pronounce the K's, but I can't help myself. It's my accent. Now, so so that's uh, <laughs> this area is no stranger to to missile strikes, rocket strikes, artillery shelling, whatever the case may be from the Ukrainian side. It is quite a, a strategic point with command bases, uh, ammunition depots. Obviously, it's got the supply line that uh, Russia can't use at the moment because the, the road portion of it has been taken out by the Ukrainians and they'll continue to do so as well uh, every time that uh, Russia tries to, to repair the bridge, but they are not having such luck. Then we'll move across to, let's see, oh, okay, we've got Crimea. This is more of an interesting thing, I suppose. So a Russian KH-32 cruise missile washed up in Crimea, really sort of just like on the beach. So it's most likely a, a failed missile. Only this type has been in service with the Russian military. So perhaps uh, it was uh, a, a faulty one and fell out of the sky. And I realize that sounds like a joke, but it actually happened just yesterday with a, a Russian hypersonic missile. And a couple of weeks ago, again, with a, a Russian Iskalanda ballistic missile as well. I actually showed the footage for that one too at the time. So they fizzle out. Uh, they're just, uh, I guess, not as good quality as, uh, as the Russian forces would have hoped they would be. And speaking of cruise missiles, if we just jump across to uh, Odessa, Ukrainian air defenses intercepted a Russian cruise missile over the Oblast. Uh, Russia fired the Kalabar cruise missile from the Black Sea. So they've got some ships quite a distance away because last time they had some ships up close, they sank like this Moskva right here back on April 15th. Now I'll move across to the news where mm, I'll start off. I've got some really irritating news that I, I guess I just have to share. So a mass burial site containing around 400 graves has been found in the liberated Izium area. This is very reminiscent of the uh, Buka killings in March this year as well, uh, at the time where uh, the, the Russian forces pulled back from the, the Kiev region. Now the first time this happened back then, uh, like these caught the international community off guard. But now I suggest we can see a bit of a pattern forming in the, in the very least with the way the Russian military operates. Obviously completely against any Geneva con uh, convention rules. I guess this reminds me of the expression, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. So the international community is not going to stand for yet another verifiable Holocaust-like event perpetrated by the Russian forces on Ukraine. 
in the end, Russia is really hurting themselves with this sort of stuff as well. So Russia is turning themselves into a, a prior state on the international stage. Now, in other news, uh, the US is announcing a new $600 million weapons package for Ukraine. In particular, it includes uh, additional HIMARS ammo, artillery rounds, uh, 1,000 Excalibur artillery rounds. These things are pretty amazing precision guided munitions. 25 miles or about 40 kilometers of range and accurate to within about 12 feet of the target or about four meters. Now, in other news, President Zelensky of Ukraine has said that Russia has launched launched over 3,800 missiles at Ukraine since February 24th, the commencement or the beginning of the war. And Zelensky said, and I quote, but no missile will bring Russia closer to its goal. There will be no subjugation of Ukraine. Each missile brings Russia closer to greater international isolation. And Zelensky said that just yesterday. Now, in more interesting uh, news, Pope Francis says it's morally acceptable to supply Ukraine with weapons for self-defense. So, a bit interesting coming from a pope. So, he said self-defense is not only licit, meaning legal, but also an expression of love for the homeland. Someone who does not defend oneself, who does not defend something, does not love it. So the Pope is now pretty much all in on the on the international community side. So that's nice to see. Yeah. And in some breaking news, uh, we have uh, Greece will supply 40 BMP-1 infantry fighting vehicles, just otherwise known as IFVs for short, to Ukraine. So that, that's quite a good number there. These are actually Soviet-era vehicles, so uh, that it's, it's good to see. It is something that the Ukrainians are already 100% trained on as well. And in other armed supplies, we have Germany, uh, which is to provide Ukraine with 50 Dingoed armored vehicles. Germany will also provide two more Mars to multiple rocket launchers and 200 rockets. Now we'll move on to this piece of interesting news. Um, and in a sign of economic sanctions on Russia working, the Russian government is administering an across-the-board cut of 10% in their budgetary expenses. And this is in reaction to a larger-than-expected decline in uh, fiscal revenues over the summer. Now, I'll say uh, larger-than-expected to them, but, but not to the, the really the rest of the international community. They've been sanctioned to the Wahoo after all. And the deficit amount is uh, close to 1.5 trillion rubles. So that's their local currency. And this is likely only the first step. Now, economic sanctions aren't designed to work instantly. That's, that's not how they work. Instead, what they really do is show cracks over time. In fact, I could do a whole video on this and I probably one day will, but you've probably heard of the old military expression, a war of attrition. What happens when uh, Russia's economy sinks? They won't be able to have any sort of economic output to support the purchase of, or, or really indeed the creation of, of munitions required to continue their war on Ukraine. Pretty much the end goal. And just a bit of a quick funny to round it all off with. We've seen stuff like this before, but at a regional summit, in Uzbekistan uh, in the last 24 hours. Putin, uh, who visited there, was publicly humiliated again. So previously the Kremlin, Kremlin head, i.e. Putin, used to, make, uh, he used to make world leaders wait for him just before a meeting. Now the president of Kyrgyzstan allows himself to be late for a meeting with Putin. Same exact thing happened uh, a few weeks ago with Turkey's Erdogan, who, who made uh, the, the Russian President Putin wait for about a minute or two. So that was quite funny at the time there. He looks very nervous as he, as he waits <laughs> every time. So that's pretty much it for today, guys. Uh, thanks for watching. Please leave a comment, subscribe, hit that like button. Sorry for the technical difficulties in yesterday's video, if you noticed them. <laughs> if you watched the video, you would notice them. And um, yeah, uh, try, try not to let the, the trolls in the comments section bother us too much. We're a community here, it's, uh, standing up for in, in solidarity for Ukraine, obviously. And uh, yeah, I do hope to see all you guys there in the next one. 
Cheers.